Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. That was one, two, three, four, five. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you all. Glad you're all here. Good morning, everybody. It's Scott City today. John White's up there being me, and uh, he's better looking than I am. Uh, but he's up there shepherding the people at Scott City this morning, and they're tuned in now after their worship set, and, and uh, we're going to turn, um, turn to the Word. Well, the joke's kind of on me today. Maybe this will make you laugh. Maybe it won't. You know, if you can laugh at yourself, it's pretty good. But when I preached here two weeks ago, I had, I left a breathman in my mouth. So you, let me know what I'm talking about. And evidently on the video, you could see two large white gatherings right here on the corner of my mouth. And uh, well, it wasn't rabies that I know of. I think I had my shots. Uh, uh, and my buddy Ron was over here and I was preaching. He's going like this. Well, you know, now I'm not preaching right now, but you know, when you start to preach and the anointing comes and God does his thing, in your subconscious, you don't pay attention to what's happening in this part of it. And so in my brain, I'm going, why is he wiping his lips? Ron, quit wiping your lips. You're distracting me. He said, oh, and, and, but funnier than that, I love my wife, but she did this. This is true. She's texting me from Scott City. And like my phone is on the front row right now, as if I'm going to see the text and she's telling me in the text, wipe your mouth. <laughs> and afterwards I said, honey, how am I supposed to see the text? I'm in the middle of the sermon. Well, I just thought, I just thought maybe you, well, nevertheless, hopefully that won't happen today. I don't have any breath mints in my mouth. Um, and yesterday we went to, we did a little work at Scott City Campus Church and went to Wendy's and I, I got that, that new uh, barbecue chicken sandwich. Y'all had that yet? Oh, mercy. Somebody give that guy a raise, whoever created that. So goofy old me, I was so hungry, I took a bite immediately and burnt my tongue. So all day, I, all day yesterday, I was like, oh, my tongue. So who knows what's going to happen today, except maybe the, the Lord will help us. It'll be good. Nevertheless, so we're in a series of unity. Unity. And today we're going to be in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. I'm going to kind of pick up following the Lord's lead here and, and uh, this understanding of the early church, what, what did the early church do in their unity? How did they become united? Now, when, when we're talking about this unity, we're talking about biblical unity. We're not talking about we all love one another and agree with one another, because that, that's natural, that happens. We're talking about being the hands and feet of Jesus on planet Earth. We're, we're talking about functioning in the anointing of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the purposes of God. That's what the church is here for. Aren't you glad today that you know the church does not exist for you? The church exists for God's purposes in the world. The church exists for the Holy Spirit to come and abide in all of us and transform us through the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit to become like Christ. That's what Christian means in the Greek, little Christ. So you should be Jesus in your actions, in your attitude, in your priorities, in your values that you and I reflect Jesus. And in that anointing, then the church functions to preach the gospel and make disciples and, and care for one another and, and lift up the saints and all the things that the New Testament teaches. And we've heard that and we know that. But there's the biblical unity factor that must be in place for the church to function on its fullest potential. And we've been discovering that. We, we've been in the book of Acts and we continue on with that. And so today the Lord's given me this, this simple premise, this principle. Let's look at the simplicity of living by the Spirit. The simplicity of living by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So Acts chapter 4, uh, just follow along. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. As they were speaking to the people, now this is Peter and John, uh, Brother John was there last week in Acts chapter 3, and he's, preached his, he's preaching his second sermon. The, remember, the crippled man is healed, and this is that we pick up right there. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 
5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas and the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed him in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which you rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, Peter, he's got the Holy Spirit. It says that here. Luke writes that. Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. He's, he's now basically preaching his third sermon. His third sermon here. And we see some truths here that are so significant. So we, we've got this cast of characters in the story. Do you, do you recognize some of these names? Annas, Caiaphas. These are the guys that put Jesus to death. Peter's talking right directly, if you would, to the enemy. But they're asking, and if you want answers, the Holy Spirit will give to you. He's going he's gonna to lay them out for them. And so they're, they've arrested them. They keep them in jail overnight. They bring them back out in the morning. They gather all this cast of characters together, and they begin this inquisition as to what has happened. How, <coughs> excuse me, did this man, who we all know, as we'll see later in the text, is 40 years old, and he's been laying at the gate his whole life, begging for money every day just to survive, and now he's standing next to you and John. How did this man get healed? You see these words, that something's starting to click. By what power, by what name did you do this? They still haven't accepted who Jesus is. By what power, what, what name have you done this? And so Peter just begins to break it down for him. Here's some truths that jump out for us. Number one, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will fulfill the purposes of God. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will fulfill the purposes of God. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, as we see in Peter's example... And we're going to dig deeper here in a moment. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is the place where God has called all of us. We have our salvation. The New Testament teaches us of sanctification, where we surrender our whole self to God at an altar of prayer on our knees and in a, in a place of submission to Him because we say, God, without you, I, I struggle, I take two steps forward and three steps back and there's something more to this and there is a sanctifying power, second work of grace that God can do that sets you free from your sinfulness and transforms you and makes you into the image of Jesus that you don't have to struggle with sin, you can live free of sin. Amen. We believe that, right? If you're struggling in sin today, you might be in a good salvation spot, but I tell you, friend, there's something greater out there. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. We have our salvation, our sanctification, and what, what God's shown us in this unity series is there's the life of the Spirit. And that's what the book of Acts shows us, the early church and, and the other churches and the other apostles and, and the apostle Paul and the early churches and, and his missionary journeys in the church. There was a work of the Holy Spirit that was the basic replacement of Jesus in the flesh. So we're not on our own. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will fulfill the purposes of God. And if the desire of your heart is to make a difference in people's lives, you'll need the Holy Spirit to do it. Because those are the purposes of God, to make a difference in the world, make a difference in people's lives. So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we see that in verse 8. Then Peter, 
filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. And he begins to break it down. Okay, how do I get filled with the Holy Spirit? You seek it. it it's really not complicated. It's simple. The simplicity of living by the Holy Spirit is simply this. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'm yours, Lord. Change me, transform me. Do whatever it takes, God, to make me a man of faith, a woman of faith, a man filled with the Spirit, a woman filled with the Spirit, God. And we seek that every day. And the more you seek it, the more you will experience it. And the more you experience it, the more you will want it. The more you will realize its value. And so daily your prayer, like the Apostle Paul said, I die to myself that you may live through me. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the fulfilled purposes of God. Here's another truth for you. The filling of the Holy Spirit will lead you to formulate the right thing to say. The filling of the Holy Spirit will lead you to formulate the right thing to say. I think one of the things I know the devil's fought me on, maybe he fights you, is if I really share my faith, what am I going to say? Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 to his disciples, hey, listen, when they arrest you, now he's talking to them as, as they're going to become leaders of the church. When they arrest you, don't worry about what to say, for the Spirit of the Father will give you the words to say. There is a work of the Holy Spirit that will help you formulate the words to say. If you seek the Spirit because you want to be filled with the Spirit to fulfill the purposes of God, God will give you the words to say. And Peter did that, didn't he? I mean, he just laid it out. He's respectful, rulers and elders of the people. If we're on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this sick man's been made well, let it be known to you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man's name, he now stands before you well. And I love that verse 12. And there is no other name, no other name on earth, by which we can be saved. That's what his name means, the one who saves. He is Jesus. He's the savior of the world. And Peter just lays it out there. Now I wonder if it really shocked him. You know, what it really got him, here you got all the, remember that, those words there, the high priestly descent? Ooh. These are the leaders of the synagogue, the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees are there because they don't believe in the resurrection. Ooh. And Peter lays it out and he reminds all of them, hey, your grandpa can't save you. Your grandma can't save you. Your daddy can't save you. Your mama can't save you. Your brother can't save you. Your sister can't save you. Your family members, your friends, titles and position and fame and power. There is nothing and no one else on planet earth by which we can be saved except by Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Amen. Amen. And I bet you they didn't applaud. They're not impressed. Remember, these are the guys in the middle of the night that are going, we're going to kill him, and it's going to stop this. No other name you can be saved by. And it's no different for us today, everybody. There's only one name that we can be saved, and it is the name of Jesus. And we can have the formulated words to say. Well, let's pick up with the story. Let's, let's go to verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. I, John, I want to go, ooh. I mean, they, they think that's really powerful to take that position. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. 
But Peter and John answered and said to them, What is right in the sight of God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Wow. So something happens and the priest and the Sanhedrin leaders and the, the Sadducees and they observe something. Look at this next truth. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit when you have been with Jesus. Verse 13, now, now they realize they were just untrained, uneducated men. Why is that important? Well, it's important in this context because they all were. So for you to recognize the authority of God and the sovereignty of God and the history of God and to know the will of God and the ways of God, you would have had to have gone through the Sanhedrin and the synagogue and the rabbi training and all that was a part of that for you to begin to have a clue of what we know about God. But in this moment, because they could not deny the noteworthy miracle that had happened, this man that they knew personally who was crippled is now well. They can't deny it. They can't argue with it. They can't debate it. There's nothing they could say. Except these guys have been with this Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. These, these guys, these leaders, they got Peter and John in the middle of the room with the crippled guy. They watched Jesus heal crippled people. They, they listened to his sermons. They were peeking through the windows in Zacchaeus' house. They were, they were listening to what was taking place in a lot of different moments in the Gospels that we could illustrate over and over. They saw it, they felt it, they knew it, they wouldn't believe it. But now, now that two ordinary men, untrained, uneducated, whoa, there's something to this. Hey, listen, friend. If Peter and John get filled with the Holy Spirit because they've been with Jesus, that's the same truth for you and I. The more time every day that you spend with our Lord and Savior in reading of the Word and prayer and devotion, the more you devote yourself to the teachings of Scripture, the more time you draw closer to Him, He draws closer to you. The more that you invest into your spiritual life and the less you invest into the things of this world that are fleeting and passing, that literally can hold your faith back from growing, you set those things aside and make your priority the purposes of God for your life. You will experience an anointing of the Holy Spirit and you will be noted by those around you. You've been with Jesus. Being with Jesus changes us just like it did them. And though he is not here in the flesh, though we don't have him like they did, we have the Holy Spirit, which is the comforter and the guide and the convictor of our sin. And Jesus said, the Father will send the Spirit in my place. So the closer you draw to God through his presence, you will be like him and he will change you and you become filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I hear another truth here. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you aren't concerned with cultural PC, political correctness. You only focus on kingdom PC, the priorities of Christ. I made that up. Ain't that pretty good? Well, the Lord gave that to me. That's not bad, though. That's not bad. But, but, but you see what he said there? Now, listen, we're going to tell you guys, we, we, we don't want you... Preaching and talking in this name anymore. Stop it. Can you hear him talking? Can you hear him? Stop it. We, we are the leaders of the synagogue. 
So this man's been healed, that's great. Now you're going to leave this place and don't you go out of here and preach this Jesus and talk about this Jesus and don't bring him up in the public because if you haven't caught on, we figured it out. There's now 8,000 people that are following you. 3,000 from the first sermon. It said here, 5,000 from the next one. What happened? Hold on a second. There's 8,000 people that have turned to God and we don't like that. You see how ridiculous you sound when you stand up for the things of the world, your own way, your own, your own agendas, your own priorities, and then you get wrapped up in being so politically correct by what you say and what you do because you want to hang on to what you got because control feels better than letting go. But in the kingdom, the priorities of Christ become the very opposite of the world. So we let go of to grab a hold on to. We replace our agenda with his agenda. And Peter and John understood that. And so you become less cultural PC and more kingdom PC. And the priorities of Christ will become the highest importance to you that everything you're wanting to do is to honor him because of all that he's done for you. And the Holy Spirit will do that inside of you. Could it be? Could it be? That even the church as a whole, we've just been enough influenced by political correctness of this culture in America that we have pushed the kingdom PC to the back burner. We hope and pray for God to accomplish his purposes. But we cling on to what we can see, what we know, what we're comfortable with, and I tell you, friend, it grieves the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul admonished the church, don't do anything to grieve the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't hold the Holy Spirit back. Don't keep it at bay. Don't, don't become so comfortable. Don't, don't become so traditional. Don't hold on to the past more than the present. Don't, don't do anything you can do and and by all means, don't try to find this balance between the world and the kingdom. Because we don't understand the kingdom PC. Paul told the early church, you, you clearly need to be in the world, but not of the world. That you need to be the salt and the light and the... The shining city on a hill and you're the presence of Jesus and your actions and your words and your priorities. But, but you don't need to be doing the things of the world to try to reach the world. And there's a, there, listen, I, I, that, that's crept into the church, hasn't it? Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying this church, I'm not saying the Scott City Campus Church, but, but, but it has, we, we, we can find ourselves, what used to be black and white is now gray. Issues of the culture that, that we knew were clearly defined by the word of God. Hey, listen, they haven't changed. Sin is sin. And if God addressed it, it's sin. And, and, and we want to be careful here that, well, we want, to, we want to accept everybody. We want to love everybody. And that is true. We should accept everybody and love everybody. But in, in true love, we can look at a brother or sister or friend and say, listen, if you want to know more about it, you might be living in sin. And what you're doing. And you're not reaching your full potential. And there's, there's a struggle there. And listen, church, we need to come before God and confess that we maybe been dropping the ball, we got a little lazy, we got a little set back, and God, we need a fresh dose of your Holy Spirit. A fresh infilling of the Spirit on us personally, on us corporately. Because this is the context that God works. And this is the simplicity of the Holy Spirit. So they, we, we can't stop talking about it. Well, let's, let's begin to wrap it up here. When they had received, verse 23, when they had received, when they were released, they went to their own companions and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, 
It is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your father David, your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They're quoting the Old Testament. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Wow. Now that's a prayer meeting. They rallied together. Here's another truth for us today. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will go to your people for prayer and you'll be changed by the power of kingdom unity. Amen? That's what they did. So they're released. And by the way, they didn't cower. Look at the prayer. So help us to speak. They told us not to. Help us to speak with confidence, oh God, and proclaim this name of Jesus. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there's an inclination. If you're struggling, if something's happened, it's a little bit of a challenge. The Holy Spirit will hook you up with somebody else who's your people like they did, and they'll go and report what's happened. But listen, it ain't a gossip session. It ain't let's talk bad about them. It ain't time to bash them. It ain't what are we going to do? We don't get an answer. and We just kind of stay stuck in that rut. Uh Uh-uh. It's, oh God, we're turning to you. We need you more. That was a challenge, but you're so good and faithful and true. And now, oh God, through your spirit, anoint us to speak with a greater confidence and boldness and proclamation of who Jesus is for those who want to hear it and those who will receive it. Woo! You'll go to your people and you'll experience the power of kingdom unity. But it doesn't stop there. It says, and when they had prayed... The place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. Last truth, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't help to give testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It burns in your bones. I woke up this morning at 625 and this sermon was burning in my bones. And the Lord was was moving and the Lord was saying, listen, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the power. And when I was here two weeks ago, one of our teenagers came and he said, he said, man, that was a great sermon. I felt something here. It was powerful. That's the anointing. So I told him, I said, that's the Holy Spirit. That's not about me. That's about God. And that's what they were experiencing here. And so the prayer time ends and the place they were meeting was shaken. Now now listen, I've never been in a prayer meeting where the building shook. Probably you haven't either. What would that be like? (laughs) I mean, what if we really waited on the Lord? And sought God in prayer. What if we really sought to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And God so moves that the place you're meeting in shakes. But not a window breaks. Not a door falls off the hinges. The house doesn't shift on the foundation. Listen, it's real. It happens then. It could happen today. If God so chooses to manifest himself by his power through his spirit and he wanted to shake a building where believers are praying, he'll shake it. He doesn't need your permission. But I believe of all that can happen among us believers today, 
is that we can come together and we can pray in the right way, in the right time, and the right priority, and watch God shake us up with a filling and anointing of the Holy Spirit that causes us to leave that place and go proclaim and teach and model and be an example by action and attitude and character and speech. I'm telling you all, there is an anointing that God wants to do to shake up the world around us. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you, you can't help to proclaim the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You can't. You, you just want to share it with people. You just want to tell. I, I, find myself, I find myself at the county attorney and I'm, I'm working and doing all that stuff. And somebody comes in and man, my heart starts to beat out of my chest. And I so desperately want to say something to them. But, but, but I can't. Not in that setting. But I'll pray for them. And I'll say, God, make, make me run into that person at the bank. Make me run into that person at the grocery store. And that's happened a couple times where I said, hey, hey, I, I remember you in the office. You doing okay? You came in a pretty tough situation. God, God can work in any circumstance, in any situation, but we have to take the initiative and seek the anointing and the filling of the Holy Spirit. We need to discipline ourselves to move from our salvation to sanctification, to living by the Spirit. And the Acts chapter four is so profound and so amazing, but so simple. This is the simplicity of living by the Spirit. It's not complicated, but it's not something God does on his own by his choice. But it is something that God responds to when his people Pray. When his people come united around the purposes of God. When, when his people even here, the Garden City campus and the Scott City campus, if we would more and more discipline ourselves and seek the filling of the Holy Spirit to ask God every day to help us to lead one person to connect with him, to grow in him, to begin to serve him because this is the defined purposes of God for this church. God would begin to shake us up and shake up our scenario and shake up our situation. God has not changed. The Holy Spirit has not changed. The way God works has not changed. Our culture has changed. The world has changed. The culture is changing. The world is changing. That's not our focus. Our focus is kingdom unity. Our focus is the purposes of God. And we, we wrap it up here with this main point, this one thing to get. When followers of Jesus are in true unity in his church, abundant grace is upon them all. It's the last part of verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. What, okay, what's that really mean? Well, here it is. That's where God begins to work. That's when God shows up in a powerful way, a significant way, a profound, measurable way. I mean, if you thought his presence was good during worship today, Man, you really get in the presence of God. It's amazing. I've seen God move in powerful ways in my life. I've seen people get saved in an altar prayer as a little boy, not knowing their story or what was going on, but watch people confess their sin and watch people pray over them and pray with them. And then the testimony came when I came into church tonight I was struggling with, but that burden's gone. I've seen the power of God move in churches where the opening song, you get through the first line and people were coming to the altar in prayer of confession and burden and seeking the Lord. I've seen God move in revivals and camp meetings and, and environments and situations and circumstances that quite frankly, we don't see God moving today in that way. And it isn't because God has changed. We may not be really 
living by the simplicity of the Holy Spirit. I saw God change my life. I, I, I could bore you with hundreds of moments, hundreds of moments where abundant grace has been all over me and I didn't deserve it. I've seen the abundant grace of God answer prayers over time that you thought would never get answered. I've seen the Holy Spirit in my mother's life. I've seen the Holy Spirit in other great men and women of faith in their life. And when you see it, you cannot deny it. It's real. And the simplicity of the Holy Spirit for all followers of Jesus to come and God will begin to let his abundant grace be on us all. What's that really look like? I, I, I don't know. I don't know the future. Does that mean God's going to call me to Africa? Is he going to ask me to quit my job? I don't know. Most likely not. I think he wants to use you where you are. You are where you are for a reason. That's your mission field. You rub shoulders with people every day that I don't. And vice versa. And all across this room. And if we all just loved and served and reached and witnessed and shared and led one person to Christ in the next 12 months, this place would begin to shake. Not literally, necessarily. I mean, God can do that. Inside of us, there'd be this sense of the move of God and the hand of God. So I, I, don't, I don't know that part, but I do know the how. And the how is prayer. The how is the very thing the pastor started this series on, that we would wait and pray. Here's what I, I sense from the Lord today. Both campuses today, I, I'm just asking us to come and pray. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, whatever stage you're at is awesome, I know. But I encourage you today to seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. God wants to use you and God wants to bless you. And God wants to reveal himself in greater ways than you've already experienced. And for us to come together like they did in response to challenging times and come together and pray. So I just want us to do that today. That's simple. The simplicity of the Holy Spirit in our response and prayer. Come and you can kneel at the altar and stand.